as you read through the narratives in Exodus, do you ever feel like stopping and, and ever thinking, man, I, I wish I was there when God was showing up like this? I would really wish this way. Even as a new believer, I wish that I was there when God was giving the Ten Commandments. I wished I could hear God speak audibly like he did to the Israelites. We all wish all of that because I think we do not really comprehend what it means to have an encounter with a God who is full of power, a God who is holy, a God who is mighty, a God who comes forth in all of his glory. We were at the Titan Sound Theater a couple of weeks back in Pennsylvania. And what we witnessed there was absolutely spectacular. I have never, ever seen anything like that. But the sight and sounds that the people of Israel were experiencing in this passage was infinitely greater than that. They did not just sit back and, and relax and enjoy, but they were gripped with fear and they trembled at what they witnessed of God. If in the previous passage, we see God giving the Ten Commandments, this section throws light into what happened uh, in the background after God gave the Ten Commandments and how the people of Israel responded to God when he showed up. And through this passage, I, I'd like to present to us two things for our consideration. Here's the first thing. Number one, God is to be feared. Here is the setting in which God gave the Ten Commandments. We'll have to go back to Exodus chapter 19, verse 16 to 19. This is what the Bible says. On the morning of the third day, there, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The people then heard God give the Ten Commandments. And chapter 20, verse 18 to 21, we see their response to that. If you look at chapter 20 and verse 18 and 19, this is what Scripture says. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking and the people were afraid and trembled, they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. When they saw the thunder and the lightning, the, the mountain smoking and shaking, they were afraid. They trembled. As one author says, for well, the people witnessed, shook the core of their being. Brother, sister, do we tremble before God like that? 
Or do we trivialize him to a point where we treat him like this grandfather of ours who we can have fun with, who we can play with, or some other being just like us? Like sometimes people say, oh, God is my bud, or God is my bay, or God is, you know, I'll go and chill with him. If you were there at the mountain, we would not dare to chill with God. Because these verses show us the otherliness of God. God is not like us. He is God. There is no one like him. None can match his majesty. He is majestic in holiness and mighty in power. The earth shakes and the mountains tremble when he speaks. This is not a being we can play with. He, he cannot be trifled with. He's not someone we can be casual and careless around. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 5. God is referred to as the great and fearsome God in one of the translations. He's great and awesome. He invokes fear. He invokes awe. And the only proper response to him is to fear him. And that's why the scripture calls us to fear him. And that is in fact the conclusion of the book of Ecclesiastes that our brother Femi preached from in August. The, the conclusion of the matter is to, is to fear God and to keep his commandments. And how can we fear God? We can only fear him if we have a right estimation of who he is. And we can only have a right, right estimation of, of him if we come to scripture where he is revealed and where we can come and know him. For example, let's say you're walking on the streets and you see this random person walking by you. I'm sure you wouldn't even bother about that person. But if you knew that the person who's walking right in front of you, who's approaching you, is this great king of a nation, then the way you walk before him will change. The way you approach him will change. What was the difference? It's the recognition, it's the estimation, it's the knowledge of that person that invoked respect for him. If you're someone who's saying, you know, I don't fear God as I should, but I want to grow in the fear of the Lord, Brother and sister, you have to seek to know him in his word. Because the, no, the more you know him, the more you will fear him. God is to be feared. But what kind of fear is this? Let's look at verse 19 and 20. The Bible says, the people said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. Moses says to the people, do not fear, God has come so that you may fear him. In, in other words, he's saying, do not fear, but fear. This seems a little confusing, isn't it? Do not fear, but fear. And let me explain this. In the, in the Bible, there are, there are at least, there are two kinds of fears pertaining to God. The first kind of fear is a fear of God as a judge. 
is the fear of God's judgment. This fear makes sinners run for cover. This is a fear that makes us want to hide from God. This was Adam's response in Genesis after he sinned. When God came and said to Adam, where are you? He replies, I heard the sound of you and I was afraid. And so I hid myself. Unbelievers, those who are not saved, those who have not trusted in Jesus as their savior, will have and must have the fear of God's judgment. Notice what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. Jesus says this, he says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear. Those who kill the body and after that have nothing to do have nothing more that they can do. But I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he has killed has authority cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. There is a fear that unbelievers must have. If you have not trusted in Jesus, Friend, you must fear God's judgment. You must fear the day that you will stand before the judge of the whole world. And there is no way to escape that judgment unless you trust in Jesus as the Savior and the Lord of your life. But believers do not need to fear God that way. Believers do not need, need to fear God's judgment. That, that is what it means to be saved. You are saved from the punishment of sin. That's what 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, the apostle John says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has nothing to do with uh, Fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So for believers, this, we don't fear God's condemnation, God's judgment. Just as the people of Israel asked Moses to be their mediator in this passage, Jesus is the greater Moses, our perfect mediator who reconciled us to God. He paid the pun punishment for our sins and brought us into a relationship with him so that God is now our father and we are his children. The fear that the believer has of God is a fear that draws him closer and closer to God as a father out of deep, deep reverence for who he is, for the weight of his character and for what he has done in their lives. There is intimacy and nearness here, but there is no place for casual irreverence yes he is your father but he is your heavenly father there is imminence there is transcendence he is not like us this passage also shows us how the fear of the lord helps us look at verse 20 moses said to the people do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The fear of the Lord for the believer is a good thing. The fear of the Lord not only draws us closer to him, but also keeps you from sin. It is the antidote to sin in your life. It is the antidote to careless, casual living in your life. It is a necessary motivation for holy living. 
I'm sorry, in Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13, God's word says, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. When you revere God, you will love the things that he loves and hate the things that he hates. You will see sin as evil and wickedness before God. So much so that you want to run from sin because it dishonors God. You remember when Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife in Genesis to sin. He had the opportunity to give in to temptation. But this is what he says. He says, how can I do this wicked thing against God and runs from her? Mind you, there was no one watching him. His parents were not there. He was alone by himself, but he ran from sin because he feared God. Those who fear the Lord do not take sin lightly, are not casual about sin, but live carefully in wisdom, walk in wisdom. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you fear God, if you grow in the fear of the Lord, you will walk in ways that are wise. You will walk in ways that you are careful about your life. You will not just do whatever you want to do with your life. Brother, sister, do you find yourself giving yourself to sin? over and over and over again. If that is you, ask the Lord to cause you to grow in the fear of the Lord. And how do we grow? Like I mentioned, we will grow in the fear of the Lord if only if we have a high view of God, high view of his holy character, and we will only have a high view of God if we know him more and more. And we will only know him more when we open the Bible and meditate on his character and on his ways each day. God is to be feared. But God, not only to be feared, but this passage also shows us that he must be worshipped on his own terms. That's my Second point, God is to be worshipped on his terms. From verse 22 of chapter 20 to all the way to the end of chapter 23, it's called, the section is called the book of the covenant, where God gives the people of Israel specific laws and instructions as an expansion of the Ten Commandments, or an extension from the Ten Commandments. And in, in verses 22 and 26, God gives the people of Israel instructions about worship. God not only calls his people here in this section, whom he redeemed to worship him, but he also instructs how he should be worshipped. Because worship is not ultimately about them, but about God. But sadly, in contemporary Christianity, in a, among a lot of Christians, in a lot of churches, worship is about the worshipper. It's about what I feel. So the service planning team comes together each week and plans worship services to give people a great, wonderful experience. But it's not about how I feel. It's not about how you feel. It's about how God feels because he is the object of our worship. 
the people of Israel were not free to worship God as they wanted or follow the ways and the patterns of the pagan religions around them. If you notice in verse 23, we see God saying, you shall not make gods of silver to be with you, to be with me, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold. The ancient Near East cultures were mainly polytheistic. That is, they worshipped multiple gods. And among them, they had a favorite god that they worship a little bit more. And for the people of Israel, God was not to be one of the favorites or a favorite among the gods. He alone was to be their one true God. Sometimes well-meaning Christians talk about God being their first priority. It's like we have other areas of our lives, like family, work, other relationships. God is number one on that list, and there is number two, and number three, and number four. But that's not what this that's not what God is desiring. What God desires here is not priority. What God desires is exclusivity. God is not saying I should be one, number one and then you can have, you know, other number two, number three, number four. God is saying, no, I have to be an, in an exclusive category and everything else in another category category. You can't have God along with me. The idols that the other nations bow down to were also something that were made according to their own imaginations. But God prohibits his people to make idols after their own imaginations and worship a false God. As I said last week, we may never worship a physical idol, but we can worship a false god, a god fashioned after our own imagination, far from how he is revealed in scriptures. Sometimes people say things like this. They say, according to me, Jesus is this, this, and this. If whatever you believe is far from how he's revealed in the Bible, you are worshiping a Jesus of your own imagination. It's a false Jesus. It's another Christ, not the Christ of the Bible. The same thing applies to, you know, our worship songs. They must be flowing out from scriptures, not some fancy imagination, even if, they sound great because we want to worship God according to how he has been revealed, not make images and idols after our own imagination. God not only instructs them how to worship, but also prescribes a place of worship in verse 24. And we'll close with this. If you look at verse 24, God says, an altar of earth you shall make for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. God says, make a simple altar for me and on it you shall sacrifice your offerings. And as they do that, this is what God promises to them. If you noticed, he says, I will come to you and bless you. God promises to draw near to them and bless them. The passage, if you remember, if you were paying attention and if you um, uh, paid attention to the reading of scripture, you saw that the people of Israel trembled. They stood far off. At least twice in that passage, we are reminded 
verse 18 and verse 21, that they stood far off from God in fear. But God here makes a gracious provision through the altar of sacrifice to draw near to them and bless them. And that's what God has done for sinners like us. We who stood far off in fear, we who could not approach this God, this holy God, he made a provision through the altar of sacrifice. That is through the atoning death of Jesus on the cross for our sin. And through that, he drew near to us and he blessed us with his presence. So friend, if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, and if you are standing far away from God in fear of his judgment for your sins, here is the good news for you this morning. God in his love and grace sent his son Jesus Christ to die for your sins on the cross and he raised him on the third day so that through his sacrifice, he can draw near to you. But will you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus and his provision for you this morning? If you're a believer, let me close with this encouragement for you. As we come to worship God in the name of Jesus Christ, and as we offer up our sacrifices of, of praise to him, he continues to draw near to us. And he continues to bless us with his all-sufficient presence, even today, even this morning. So let us look to God and thank him for this wonderful blessing we have in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we were like that, stand, standing far off from you. But Lord, you drew near to us through the sacrifice of your son. And that you continue to draw us near to yourself. And as we come, Lord God, May we remind ourselves who you are. And may we walk before you in reverence. And may the fear of the Lord affect every single area of our lives. And may we glorify you through our lives. God, we pray for those who do not yet know you. Lord, would you please help them by your spirit. Know how good and gracious you are. Even though you are this transcendent God, you are, even though you are this great God, you are mighty, but you are also merciful. And in your mercy, you drew near. Or would you cause them and grant them repentance so that they might turn away from their sins and turn to you and trust in the provision that you have made available for them. We thank you, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.